Ars Electronica is much more than the center that we're in right now. It consists of the festival and the pre-Ars Electronica, and particularly it consists of a world-renowned research and development laboratory called the Ars Electronica Future Lab. And I'll welcome you today to another episode of Inside Future Lab within Ars Electronica's home delivery channel. As any time, you're asked to not only participate and watch, but to actively participate in terms of sending us comments, sending us questions, um, and I will pass them on to our today's guest, which I welcome very nice and much today, Alexander Brisril, from member of the Ars Electronica Future Lab since March, if it's exactly. correct. Thank you, Andreas. Thanks, it's great to have you here. Um, and you won a kind of internal competition, you won a prize with a project inside Future Lab. And exactly. that's what you're about to tell us a little bit about Yes. That. So uh, we have this internal competition whose goal is to, um, to make the ideas emerge from the lab. And it's called the Future Lab Ideas Expedition. Um, it's every year since one year, I think. Um, and there were multiple winners and multiple honorary mentions. And so what I got was a honorary mention along with my partner, Chloe. Very the, and it's called Our Social Forest. Exactly. Uh, so uh, this project was born uh, in this weird moment that we're living, which is, which is this pandemic that, that, that took the world and that led uh, to many lockdowns locally and globally. And uh, I came in the, the future lab, I started in March, and in the middle of March, it was already starting to, to, to have a great effect here. And this led to creativity, as, as often circumstances, circumstances lead to. Uh, and so with my partner, Chloe, which has most of an artistic background, uh, while I have more of an engineering background, uh, we decided to, to, to merge our, um, our approaches and find a way to, to reflect on what this new circumstance led us uh, to, to to think about the future. Um, and this led us, and I'll show a bit why after, this led us to, to the whole idea of um, what is human connection? Um, when we're all together, but we don't talk, we are together still, and we feel that. When you're in concert or wave, you, you feel everyone around you um, without talking to them. And that led us to think, how can we explore this human connection and this uh, complexity of uh, human behaviors that lead to a sense of belonging and lead to very complex behaviors, all in all, even though we are just living our own life. And um, this led us to think about what artists did before, because artists have a way to open a window uh, into, into complex questions and find ways to approach them in different ways. Um, here uh, you can see the, uh, an art piece by Thomas Saraceno called On Air that explores the, the, the harmony, the question of harmony as a human collective by proposing to the viewer and to the, uh, to the spectator to actually intervene in the piece, touching the strings and creating sounds. And the, and the goal that Thomas Sarsenio had is that every tone that someone creates will lead to a harmony by other people trying to continue the beauty of the tone that was created. And this is a quite impressive performance, uh, installation, but um, it led us to think, how can we find other ways to, to touch this, this question? And that's where we, we, we fell into the trap, the, the big well of, mm -hmm. of emergence. Um, emergence is a, is a question that's been approached by scientists and engineers and artists alike. And every day we see emergence, at least if we see birds or if we see uh, fish, um, pigeons. Do, do not have complex behaviors by themselves, but the swarms of pigeons have extremely complex behaviors, for example. Um, Conway's Game of Life is an example in the computer science world. 
uh, it's, a, it's a very old now in the computer sense, uh, but very young in the sense of art history uh, approach uh, to it. It's, it's, uh, it's a question of how can we, with very simple rules, and I think it's just four rules, with multiple cells, create complex things. And um, uh, the one in, on the screen on the on left currently is, is uh, shown on the PDP-7 type 330 screen in 19, 1970, which is very early in the story of computers. So there were still mainframes at the time. And more academically, there's Craig Reynolds, uh, a, a researcher, tried to model uh, in 1987 the, the flocks of birds and how birds were having complex behaviors by computer, by 3D graphics, on, on the old uh, 3D workstation of the time. Um, and, uh, and this led to a lot of, of consequences in, in the art world. Uh, notably, uh, You With Me in 1989 uh, by Susan Amcroft and Michael Girard, uh, which was actually shown at the Art Electronica Festival um, and you can uh, see in the Art Electronica archive online. Uh, and as well as Evolve in 1997, which has this same concept of exploring the flocks and complex behaviors, but within the water, like fish, and f swarms of fish. And by touching the aquarium, they added interactivity to discussion of emergence that wasn't uh, yet approached in this combination of spectator inter intervention and emergent behaviors, and they added this. And finally, a uh, big inspiration of ours was also Lionel, Lionel Moua's artwork, uh, art bots, which are small bots with uh, markers in it. These bots are very simple and uh, follow very simple rules. But together, they actually create complex uh, behaviors, complex paintings by touching each other and repulsing uh, each other for, off the walls and, uh, and thus creating patterns uh, where we, we don't think that, that there would be. Um, we also looked at how can we make something that is inherently understandable, not something that requires language, not something that uh, requires, um, requires modern technology uh, experience, but something that ev everyone can touch and have a visceral sense of how can you f I feel so that it, it suits me and that I connect to it. And my first inspiration on this uh, category was um, Franz Kafka's head, which was installed in 2014 uh, by David Czerny in Prague. And this head is made of different slices, and it's very, very high. Um, and the slices turn seemingly independently, but to create new patterns. And uh, you can see a very Kafkaesque rendition sometimes um, of, of Franz Kafka's head. And um, secondly, this, the, the, the piece, uh, Warp in Space, uh, which uh, is a production of the Art Electronica Future Lab uh, in 20, 2009 in the Art, uh, Art Electronica Center, um, allows you to, to, to pull on a rope and have uh, on the other side of the world, maybe, uh, someone pulling on the rope at the same time. And you have this human connection through a rope that actually like, feels like it's, it's, it's going across continents. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's quite older than that, actually. Uh, and currently, it's linking the Ars Electronica Center in Linz and a museum in Wales. And it's quite, it's quite it's still a very popular installation, installation in the center. center. Exactly. <laughs> it has this kind of very playful and joyful experience to it. And I think this is one of the things that you would like to uh, address with your, with your project as well. Exactly. This, this, this idea of, of being able to interact with people without talking to them, without having video. It's not a Skype call. Uh, it's, it's visceral communication. And that's something that, mm. that, that made me really think about, we can do better, we can do more. Um, and finally, two more atmospheric inspirations of, of ours were uh, Joel Duret's uh, 2019 installation in the uh, Fondation Louis Vuitton in Paris, uh, which is a connected small extract of a forest um, where human beings, by their own presence, and expiration and consumption of CO2, of uh, oxygen and expiration of CO2, influence the forest. And this forest is linked by electronics that actually water them, that make them, uh, that, that take care of them. And by influencing it, you influence the electronics, you influence the plants, and it's a whole ecosystem where you, you, you feel inside it entirely. 
And finally, a very visual uh, inspiration was uh, Avatar by, by the, uh, James Cameron, which is uh, the first uh, blockbuster 3D uh, um, movie, uh, which led opened technological doors and as well uh, had a very striking appearance. So what's the concept we had? The concept we had then was to think of human beings as cellular organisms and humanity as a multicellular, very complex uh, organism. Um, and we thought about how can I can make it tangible, how can I make it visceral uh, to, to, to be part of this community. Our proposal is, um, and that's uh, uh, quite um, a uh, special way to approach it is a two meter high tree um, uh, which is part of, is part of a worldwide network of similar trees and, and each tree form uh, in itself a very complex uh, response to human beings being across it and through a worldwide forest which we call the social forest lead to this connected uh, experience where everyone around the world actually interact with each other across the world uh, through these trees. These trees are in a way a new form of phone for Skype uh, uh, or VR for, for, for new modes of communication. Maybe if I ask a question, why did you come up with the concept of trees? I mean this is usually not the thing that you would like interact. We know that we can manipulate trees, you can make them move and, and, or in bend in certain directions all, but over a long, long period of exactly. time. So why trees? Well, uh, research is, uh, is more clear than ever than that trees have a very complex uh, communal behavior, some may call it social, uh, with their symbiotic relationship with uh, mycelial network, with mushrooms, uh, they communicate. They communicate uh, when there's a danger, they communicate when things are going well. And, um, and that's a communication network that you don't see, but that you feel. When you're in forest, you feel that the forest is, is going fine, if the forest is not going well. Um, and that's something that's visceral to you as a human being. We were uh, exploring forests before, we uh, before we were having Skype calls. Mm -hmm. And that's something that's very uh, wired into us. So that was the main, uh, the main reason. And also the tree as uh, a construction allows a lot of flexibility uh, because it takes a 3D space uh, which is directly relatable. And these trees um, have this, m must react to human beings. And to react to human beings, we, we went for, for different, um, different technical and artistic approaches. The skin, uh, the outside of each branch of this tree, uh, will be made of a flexible mesh that you can actually interact with. And this mesh is, um, th this mesh is made of uh, conductive strands, and I'll talk to it about it after, uh, and structural strands. And this has this kind of organic feeling that makes you see something that is at the same time technologically striking and organically relatable. And the inside will be very thin bones to keep a very light, uh, light structure in aluminum. These trends uh, are the main technical challenge of, of our work. And I like technical challenges. Um, I think that artistic and technical challenges must uh, work together on this side. And, and that's also the, 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 the kind of motto of the Future Lab mm -hmm. and of our Ars Electronica in general, uh, technology, art, uh, science, and society, everything must be mixed. Maybe if then you said the role of, of engineering, I mean, you have an engineering yeah. background. Uh, your partner, Chloe, in this project has more of an artistic. Uh, what makes it special to work together? How did you find this idea and this collaboration? Is it only like technology driven or is it art driven? Yeah. Um, so I've, I've been interested in, in the concept of using trees for a long time. Um, and those trees uh, um, at, at first were um, a kind of exploration on what uh, academics call the Lindenmeyer systems, uh, which is a branch, a method of algorithmic botany. Um, 
of how can you describe how plants grow, how multicellular organisms grow, and it has a very striking relationship to the current question. And uh, this more technical approach to it, uh, which was amazement that we can actually describe how trees grow, uh, along with discussions uh, with, with my partner about um, we, we don't see our friends anymore. We're going to go to parties. We haven't been to a techno party for, for, for a while now. We want to go there. Uh, but we want to feel alive. And that's the main thing that we, she had this design approach of, um, of uh, let's, let's find a way for people to be invited to interact with it and not just see it as a technical, technological thing. And I had this, this wish uh, of uh, let's make something that's, uh, that's technologically striking. And we mixed together our wishes. And in the end, we, she had this interest for technology and had this interest for, mm -hmm. for, for the actual uh, design as well. I mean, uh, there's a, a question coming in and asking particularly about the design. Uh, if you think if animals or human-shaped robots would be more problematic in terms of people to interact with, or is this, are trees more neutral, so to speak? Yeah? Well, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, Animal-shaped uh, robots um, could be, so first of all, they're, they're more complex to, to build. Um, and more than that, animal-shaped robots uh, invite um, different, I think, types of, of interactions. It's, in my first reaction, it will, I would say that animal-shaped robots invite a more uh, caring relationship while trees may involve a more exploratory relationship. Uh, but it, it could be a good, a good start for another work <laughs> as well. Good. Um, so, yeah. And the connective strand, you can see, has the goal of being able to touch uh, the, the tree and have reactions from it. Technically, uh, for those that have a mechanical leaning, uh, the first concept is to actually connect the different appendages, we call them foot joints, that are made of gears. Uh, and those gears would allow uh, a relatively light construction, uh, but at the same time open uh, the construction, uh, as we think that seeing inside the piece allows you to feel more involved in it. And this leads us to the idea of um, how can we use all of this and have interactivity? And um, that's the, interacti the interactivity uh, mod modalities that we thought of. Our movement, uh, for one, um, touch and voice. Our movement of a human being allows you to greet uh, the, the, the tree and the tree greets you back. Uh, in some Asian cultures, there's the bow. Uh, in a lot of Western cultures, there's the shaking of hands. Uh, in France, there's the bees. Mm -hmm. um, we all have a way to meet each other. And we thought about transferring it to the tree as well. And by touching it, as the um, fabric is made to actually be touched, uh, the trees shiver physically, like if with a small vibration, like when you have goosebumps. And uh, light also um, emanates from, from the zone of the touching, which allows you to see some kind of uh, of reaction that we also see in, uh, in some creatures, such as blob, uh, this, this, yellow, uh, this, this yellow organism that, that, that expands and reacts to change very, very intelligently, even though it has no brain. And finally, voice. We thought about how to use, uh, to, to have something that reacts to this very natural um, tool for human beings without actually requiring to, us to say something. Um, we don't speak the same language and we wanted this to be worldwide. We don't want uh, to have a word block where someone speaks Portuguese and the other one speaks Tamil and we, they cannot understand each other. We want voice as an emotional vehicle and not as a sense, uh, like a, a meaning uh, vehicle. And so th this worldwide forest has this goal of being bridged and each tree has this uh, twin somewhere else. And that's how everything gets together and links up. Um, so if you touch a tree some, somewhere, it reacts to you, but its twin also reacts in the same way, making you be active on the other tree. And by this uh, bridge that you just created and the fact that you are 
you dupli duplicated in those two places of the world at the same time, you just created uh, something that will also influence the other people on the other side of the world uh, touching this tree. And so you're creating these reactions where they know it's the tree reacting to someone, but they, the, people, the person who is doing that is not there. And as thus, you feel the communion with, uh, with the other people. You feel that you're with other people, but you're not with them. Like when you feel you're being watched but, uh, in a forest, but you don't see the animal that's watching you. It's a bit of the same, of the same idea. Um, our proposal for worldwide deployment, that was a very, it's a very, very um, prospective deployment idea, uh, is to deploy in each continent um, of the world. And when I say continent, I mean uh, a very restrictive view of continents um, without Oceania, unfortunately, uh, but involving South America, um, Africa, and India. But are these this types of trees you're, you're developing, are they meant for public spaces or also for private? So could I get one of these trees at home? And so, yeah, uh, we, so we, we started this question actually thinking about private uh, trees. Uh, because before that, um, in an apartment complex, I want to talk with my friends, but I cannot uh, see them during the coronavirus. So I wanted to have something to interact with. Um, but we thought that to first uh, develop this technology and develop this concept, we had, we really had to, to, to deploy it uh, at as a large scale to actually push us to, to find most of the problems and then be able to scale it back and then be able to de deploy it mm -hmm. privately. And uh, actually, our new goal in a way is to find a way to scale it down to house plant, mm -hmm. uh, large house plant, like one meter high. Um, uh, which, which will allow us to, to be able to distribute it more easily. Um, and that leads us actually to, to the Moa Forest, because as you saw, uh, we have only four dots mm -hmm. in this map, but uh, we talked about twinning multiple trees together. And the idea is to actually twin the trees around the world to the Moa Forest in Linz. Uh, this project was made for the festival, and uh, even if it wasn't selected for the festival, it, 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 this whole concept stays on this, this idea of linking together the world. And uh, this mother forest, we call it, in Linz, uh, would allow us to actually create this emergent behavior. So not, not only having social communions, but actually be able to, to, to bridge manually different parts of the world. So the per person interacting in Chao Polo with their, uh, with their tree, uh, and the person interacting in Johannesburg with their tree, you, as being in Linz, you will be between the two trees, and you will be able to interact with both at the same time. So we are able to bridge human connection, just like the, uh, uh, the, the people who were bridging calls uh, before the invention of automatic uh, dial machines uh, were connecting you to your correspondent. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe a question coming back to the design, because we have this mother forest here at the moment. Uh, the concept looks very stylish, very, very designed, very technological. Do you have a goal or to, to make them look more realistic, more naturalistic, or is, there a, is this a conscious choice? So um, we had this discussion with, with Chloe, and we, we spent quite some time discussing about it. Do we want to be skeuomorphic, uh, inspired from nature? Uh, and take it up to the aesthetic level, or do we want to, to, to take the behaviors from nature, but uh, let it be shown through that it's still very technological? And we, 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 we decided to keep it very technological, uh, keeping, it, keeping it very uh, overworldly, uh, because one, we don't want to make the trees jealous, and we don't, we, we don't want to say that this is as beautiful, as good as a tree. Uh, nature is, uh, has so much uh, be beauty inside that we cannot expect to, to have any concurrence for it. Um, and also, we, we really wanted people to see that that's actually human beings making these tools. And that's, that's humanity, that's uh, we create things. But have you also thought of alternative shapes? Or was the tree, because of the background you're talking, was right the first thing that you thought of? So we, we went for many, many steps. Uh, many steps that finally ended up with the tree. 
but as as this concept goes, there was only really this uh, shape that that we we kept mm -hmm. um, in our thinking. Very interesting. Um, um, and that leads and us, that to, leads the us the to the, to the deployment scenario. So as I said, the idea would be to have um, three of them or four of them in one place, creating some kind of, uh, of, of mobile forest, and then have their twins, so each tree has a twin, uh, around the world. Um, and for example, it could be deployed in, uh, in a museum, in a gallery, um, and in a public place as well. Um, in, which will allow us to actually interact with them and create, um, cr create uh, experiences wherever you are. And ideally, we would love it for, it for it to be public and accessible to anyone. Mm. I mean, public, that's uh, coming back to you, at watching at home, the offer to send us in your comments and your questions so I can pass them on to Alexander as well. But uh, public is also another thing. You mentioned it was planned for the Ars Electronica Festival to take place there. Now we know everything's changed. Uh, the festivals, not only ours, but uh, all the others also take place in a very different shape. Is there a way that you think like an installation like this can support, can foster also this uh, kind of new normality? Yeah, exactly. We actually thought about this concept uh, uh, by expecting the, the, the festival to change shape and rely more on international uh, partners. Mm -hmm. And uh, we thought about uh, actually linking the festival so in, in Linz with, with uh, institutional partners, museums and public places uh, around the world and thus allowing people to access the festival without actually being in the festival, mm -hmm. uh, accessing it more viscerally. Um, uh, in this way. And, and now we know that the festival ha will have uh, a different approach uh, to the usual one, which is very exciting for us because this constraint will always lead uh, to, uh, to more creativity and I'm really expecting, it, expecting to see really inventive things. Yeah. I mean, besides that uh, project, uh, which is really a fantastic example, in my humble opinion, in terms of like com combining art, technology, and as you mentioned, Ars Electronica is always the triangle in this close with society. This is a perfect example of what Ars Electronica is, is capable of doing. Uh, what's beside that project and participating in these kind of awards, what's your regular role in the future? Like what, are you, um, what are you working on? What are you are allowed to tell us what you're working yeah. on? Um, so I, I, came in, uh, I came in to work on a, on a particular project uh, which involves um, finding ways to, to democratize um, or make easier access to technology and to learning technology to school children, mm -hmm. uh, mostly in underserved communities. Um, and and the, 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 the work turns around the, the idea of motivating through playfulness, creativeness and, um, uh, and educative value. And that's actually been, been, been a really fascinating experience. Uh, and I hope uh, that in the following month uh, we will be able to, to show things on the website, uh, maybe uh, depending on, on the project situation. Yeah. That's always one of the, the things that you work on for a long time and then finally you exactly. get out to release, but there are some tests going on and it looks very promising and I hope we, exactly. we can release that project soon uh, also to the public to be, to be pivoting. Um, Back to the to the to your concept because this is not there is no real tree yet is there, is there? there's no tree, real tree yet so this project um, was done with the expectation that it will not um, be able to to go forward uh, as is um, as it is very ambitious both technically and artistically but because there's a lot of of uh, of, of dark um, obscure zones that we haven't yet approached and that we only will discover these world blocks when we mm -hmm. get there and uh, with the three or four month time to, to, to go to, to market, so to go to the festival, um, uh, it would have been very, very difficult. Very, very and as well, it will require international cooperation and uh, customs and a lot of, of uh, approaches which are not so easy. But we, we're thinking with Chloe of, of actually scaling it down. So have finding a way to do one house plant and uh, this house plant will be the perfect experience for us to actually check and uh, improve the, 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 the interactivity, which is 
the core of it. So uh, first we find the interactivity and then we, we dream even bigger. Yeah, so hopefully we can display that soon in the museum. Exactly, I will, I, will, experience it I will love it, <laughs> I will love it. I think it would perfectly um, fit into us. Um, slowly coming to an end, um, you on, on purpose choose that spot here in the museum. Exactly. So maybe we should tell our visitors, our, our uh, audience a little bit why this installation here in front of these two robotic arms. So this uh, is a puppet show made by two robots. And I've always been fascinated by robots. Uh, my work has been around robots as well. And uh, I found this to be extremely striking in that regard. Uh, this actually recorded the, the movement of uh, a puppet master, a uh, master puppet master. Uh, uh, and we reproduce it with, with those two uh, KUKA robots. Uh, and it has been done by my colleagues at the Future Lab, uh, along with, with partners. And, um, and this has been inspiring to me uh, as well, uh, uh, because how can we go forward with this? Uh, if we can get a puppet master to, to record, and we do, maybe we can, we, we can actually have the AI re, uh, create some new things and improve itself. And so that's a question I'm also looking at. So how artificial intelligence kind of also supports art. Exactly. And the whole question about it. It opens up a total new topic uh, and I think there's hopefully time enough that we address in, in one of the next Inside Future Labs. Alexandre Brasil, it was great having you here in the Thank museum you, today. And uh, thanks for you watching at home. And I think it's time to let the puppet dance a little bit. So exactly. enjoy it. Thank you.